All right. Well, good morning, everybody. So glad that you are here with us today, that you have chosen to come into Yakima Foursquare. Uh, I love this place, and I love that you are here with us. Uh, we are in the fourth week of this series called The Way of Goodness, which is driving us toward the kind of people that God wants us to be and the kind of people uh, and the kind of church that God wants us to be as well. Our goal with this series is that uh, by looking at the goodness of God and the examples that Jesus set before us, that we truly can be individual who are known for goodness. And ultimately, well, we will be a church known for goodness as we look like Jesus to those that we come in contact with. Uh, last Sunday uh, after service, I got to teach through our Growth Track 2 class, uh, which is the class where we talk about our history as a church. Uh, it's where we talk about like the Foursquare movement and kind of the history there, and then also just the vision and the goals that we carry as Yakima Foursquare Church. And one of the key points in that vision and mission section is that the church is a people, not a place. The church is a people, not a place. And I talked about how I love this building. I mean, I love our church building. I love that we are on the busiest street in Yakima, 40th Avenue. Like, I'm so happy that that's where we're at. I'm glad that we have a place that we can gather and that we can worship together. Uh, but the church has never been about a building. The church was about the people. People who would gather together and chase after Jesus and live out the mission to love God, love people, and serve the world. The Greek word for church is ekklesia, which means a called out people or a called out congregation assembling together. It was the word that was used for political gatherings, for councils, uh, or board meetings. But the heart behind it was like-minded people getting together to deliberate and to carry out a vision. And that is what we are doing every week. We are assembling together to deliberate what it looks like to follow the way of Jesus. And then we're making plans to carry out his vision to reach people. And every single week, I mean, that's what we did yesterday, right? That's what we did in going out to the city and, and, and working is, hey, this is a way that we feel like we could reach people for Jesus. And so that's what we got to do. And every week we have new people who are joining this ecclesia, this church, and, and joining in on this mission to reach people for Jesus. Now, so far in this series, we've talked about uh, walking in the way of goodness. We've talked about uh, God's empathy, his compassion. We've talked about his grace, all characteristics of God that he desires for us as the church to walk in as well. But if we were to live these things out, the culture that we are actually cultivating within us and in this church is that we would be people-first culture, a people-first culture. That when we show empathy to people, when we show compassion to people, when we show grace to people, we are treating people with the same dignity, respect, and integrity that Jesus would have treated them with. And sometimes that means even when people don't deserve it. Which is why we talked about grace last week. See, church or the ecclesia is not about coming in to hear someone preach a sermon or to come in to hear some good music on a Sunday morning. No, the church is all about the people living out the way of Jesus and the way of goodness. There's a section in Luke 6 where Jesus is teaching about loving your enemies. He's talking about being generous to those who are opposite of you, praying for those you disagree with, giving mercy to those who wrong you. And he says, do to others as you would have them do to you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. There's a book uh, called A Church Called Tov uh, that actually gave us the idea for this series. And it's written as a result of, of the toxic church, church culture where we see things uh, like abuse and leadership and moral failure and sexism and racism and things like that. that are, that's just been kind of plaguing the U.S. church uh, for the last couple decades. And in that book, the author, Scott McKnight, writes, A culture of goodness begins... When a church sees people as people and treats them as people by nurturing them to become what God designed them to be. People with names and histories and stories. People who are doing well and people who are not. People who are recovering from church abuse. People who've had surgeries and sickness. People who are aging. People who are rich and poor and everything in between. People who are wounded and in need of healing. People who are unemployed and underemployed. People who need encouragement or tangible assistance. He says the essence of treating people as people can be summed up in 12 simple words from Jesus 
do to others as you would like them to do to you. The church is all about people and putting people first. And we know that, that w- that's what it's supposed to be because that is the example that Jesus set out for us. Because all people are his creation. All humanity is his masterpiece. And his desire is that every single one of his people will come to a place of repentance, which means turning away from sin, turning away from the world, turning away from distractions, and coming back to him. Jesus is pursuing people for the purpose of relationship, and he's patient with us as he does that. Some of us have experienced his patience over the many years maybe that we ran from him. But can we see people with the same eyes that Jesus sees them? I want to do something real quick. I want you to think of a person that you can't stand. Yeah, come on, we all have the people, come on. Think of someone that you're just like, man, I can't stand that person. Think of them. Maybe it's someone who rubs you the wrong way. Maybe it's someone that you disagree with. Maybe it's a politician. Maybe it's your boss. Think about them. Now, think about how Jesus sees them. And what kind of relationship he wants to have with them. Sometimes it's hard to see people through the eyes of Jesus. Because these are people that we may fundamentally disagree with. Or these are are people who vote differently than you. Or people who live different lifestyles. Or who parent differently. Or who support stuff that you disagree with. Or who don't live with the same moral code as you. But Jesus is still calling us to love his creation. Because he loves them. Not to hate them. Not to fight against them. He's calling us to bring them back to him because we are all his creation. And more than that, we are all his image bearers. In the narrative of the creation story, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. In the image of God, he created male and female. He created us in his image. And after Jesus came and died and rose from the dead, he created a pathway to salvation for all those people, all of his creation, to be able to come back to him, to have have a pathway to remember who they are. As Paul says, be renewed in knowledge of our image in Christ. So when we slander people, when we put them down, when we forecast hate more than love, We are not treating them as image bearers. And James actually calls us out on this. In James' letter in James 3, he says, With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. He says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. This should not be what we're about. This is not who we are as followers of Jesus. We should be people who put others first for his sake. I want to look at a couple of examples from Jesus' life uh, that show us how we are actually supposed to see people, treat people, and talk to them. And I just want to tell you, this is not an exhaustive list. If we were to go through Scripture and look at all the times where Jesus put other people first, we would be here till Wednesday. Okay, so there's, there's just too much there. And, but I want to look at these three stories in the Gospels uh, and, and point out to us what it looks like maybe for us to put others first. The first one is found in Luke's Gospel in chapter 19. Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem. They had to go through the city of Jericho. Jericho, it's the same city that Joshua marched around all those times in the Old Testament. The walls came down. It's also the same city that I rode a camel in a couple years ago. Still there. So they had to go through Jericho on their way to Jerusalem. And Jesus, as he was walking through Jericho, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and a very wealthy man. So Jesus is about to have a run-in with this guy who is Jewish, but he's also a chief tax collector. And what that means is that Zacchaeus made a living by working for the Romans, even though he was a Jew, collecting taxes from his fellow Jews and lining his own pockets 
to a place of being incredibly wealthy. He was a quality, upstanding citizen. <laughs> now this guy, this guy in the eyes of the people was the scum of the earth. He was, he, was, he was a traitor. He was a cheat. He was a Roman sympathizer. Like, are you kidding me? Like, they hated this guy. Let me say that again. They hated him. He was the enemy. He was the opposing side. Zacchaeus had heard about Jesus, and, and he wanted to see Jesus. And in the text, you can read the story. He was a little vertically challenged, not a very tall guy. And so he had to run ahead and climb a sycamore tree just so he could get a glimpse at Jesus. And then this happens. In Luke 19, verse 5, it says, When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. He must, what? Like, what are you talking about? You can't stay at that guy's house. There had to be people in, the, in that area who were like, no, 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 no. Jesus, I'm a good upstanding Jewish man. You should come and stay in my house. Not his house. He's the worst. <laughs> but Jesus saw Zacchaeus for who he is, and he decided that this person needs me. So Zacchaeus hops down from the tree, and he invites Jesus and his followers into his home and it says, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be a guest of a sinner. Sounds like some churchgoers I know. <laughs> Not here. <laughs> He's gone to be a guest of a sinner. How dare he? Now, we don't know how long this conversation was with Zac Zacchaeus. We don't know how long he stayed there with him. Uh, we don't know what the dialogue was about. But Zacchaeus, this bad guy, got the opportunity to sit with and experience the love and the kindness of Jesus. And after he spent time with Jesus, the text said in verse 8 that Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So just a short experience with Jesus left Zacchaeus with an entirely new outlook on life. I think some of us have had that same experience when we got introduced to Jesus. Let's look at what Jesus says. He says, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. This man too is a son of Abraham. He's saying that this man too is a child of God. This man too is his creation. And what did Jesus come to do? To seek and to save the lost. We need to be like Jesus. We need to seek those who don't know him. We need to seek those who are against him. We need to seek those who are drowning in the ways of the world and help them see Jesus, the man who in his loving kindness welcomes them in with open arms. We need to treat people the way that Jesus would treat them. Because here's the truth. Our job is not to put people in their place. Our job is not to point out all their wrongdoings. Our job is to introduce them to Jesus to lead them to Jesus. And it is Jesus through his truth and through his justice that he will bring change to their life. Jesus does the work, not us. So if Jesus is going to engage the lost, if Jesus is going to engage the enemy, if Jesus is going to engage the sinner, what excuse do we have to do anything different? The first point in putting people first is to put your enemies first. Now, enemy can mean a lot of different things. So putting your enemy first does not always mean you need to go to that person and reconcile with that person, person or whatever it may be. It might just mean that you are praying for your enemy. Now to switch away from the bad guys, the whole other group of people that Jesus put first. The second story I want to tell you is in Matthew 19. It's also told in Luke 18. It's a really quick story. It's often a story uh, that we can fly right over it if, if we're not paying close enough attention. But I believe it shows a beautiful picture of Jesus putting people first. 
Jesus had been teaching the crowds through parables, which are stories that he would tell to, to get a point across. He was healing people. And then in Matthew 19, verse 13, it says that then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. That's a beautiful picture. It says, but the disciples rebuked them. What? The disciples rebuked them. The disciples turned away the children. Maybe they thought, you know what? <laughs> so glad you're here, but Jesus is really tired. He's been really, working really hard for the last couple of days. Okay, he needs to rest. And we know that children are not very restful. <laughs> Parents in the room, you know. Or maybe they just thought Jesus wasn't that interested in the children. Whatever they thought, they were wrong. Because Jesus quickly corrected them and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. See how he elevated the children. Didn't put them down. He elevated them. And Luke's telling, it tells the same story. Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And then he says, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. So not only does Jesus make space for children, but he also actually calls the adults to be more like them in their faith. Now, I would say that generally, it's easier for us to engage with the children in our lives than maybe our enemies, but we have to ask ourselves the question, are we hindering them from an opportunity to be with Jesus? See, church is an incredible place for our kids to be on Sundays. Bringing your middle schoolers and high schoolers to youth on Wednesday night can be transformational. We actually have parents here today who are part of our church uh, who are either teachers or, or parents or, or work for Riverside Christian School, and it's RCS Day at church. And, and they're, they're here. They have their kids out of that school. We have our kids there as well, and we love it. And while our kids will be introduced to Jesus in their class on a Sunday morning, and if you have kids in Christian schools, they're getting opportunities to learn from Jesus there too. But what does our daily life look like for our kids? When they look at us, maybe just around the house or as we live our life with them, are they picking up on who Jesus is in us? I know this is a little pointed at a specific demographic of this room, but if you're a parent in this room, your number one goal as a parent should be to give your kids every opportunity to meet with Jesus and not hinder them in any way because Jesus says, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. So the second point in putting people first is to put your children first. Now, the last story I want to hit quickly is a moment in John 4 where Jesus engages with a Samaritan woman at a well. And we went through this story earlier this year as we were going through John's gospel. But to paraphrase, uh, there's this Samaritan woman who's at a well by herself in the middle of the day. And Jesus shows up and asks her for a drink of water, which surprises her because he was a Jew. And the racial tension between the Jews and the Gentile, or Jews and the, the, the Samaritans was so intense that they wouldn't even speak to each other. And she's like, wait a minute, you're a Jew. Why are you talking to me? But Jesus overlooked that and he began speaking the truth of salvation to her and to her people. Jesus mentioned her current reality that she was living with a man who was not her husband and that she'd been married five times. And while in our culture today, we often uh, have thought this to be a sign of promiscuity, Oh man, this woman got around. But if you actually understood the culture at that time, this woman was likely not promiscuous, but instead highly shamed. She was an outcast. Her husbands had probably left her because she couldn't bear them any children. And the man that she lived with now was probably just taking care of her because women at the time were helpless within their culture without the support of a husband. So what did Jesus do? He saw her for the person she was. And he spoke truth and love over her, giving her purpose, giving her meaning, and giving her his salvation. And instead of being the outcast woman 
who was alone drawing water in the heat of the day when no other woman was there because she was ashamed, she became the woman who went back into her village in Samaria, preached the good news of the Messiah that she just met, and many of them got saved. Jesus saw the woman for who she was and then changed her story. And this happens throughout the gospel with people who are disregarded by their peers. It happened with people who were crippled. It happened with people who were begging on the streets. It happened with people who were prostitutes, with adulterous women. Jesus would see the outcasts of their culture and reveal to them who they truly were in his eyes. Can we not do the same? Can we not see those who are on the outskirts of culture, who maybe more often than not we will walk on the other side or not pay attention to them? Could we instead be like Jesus and see them the way that he sees them? That quote from earlier from Scott McKnight, a culture of goodness begins when a church sees people as people and treats them as people by nurturing them to become what God designed them to be. This is the example of Jesus, and we get to do the same. So the third point in putting people first is put the outcasts first. And like I said earlier, there are so many more stories that we could unpack of how Jesus would put people first. We can't cover them today. But if we want to be like Jesus, we need to be able to put people first, no matter what their story might be. No matter what they've gone through, no matter what they're going through, no matter their life choices, we get to show love. We get to show others that same loving kindness that Jesus showed us. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you for giving us examples on how to live out our lives. Lord, that you were the perfect example of love. You were the perfect example of kindness. You were the perfect example of goodness. And you continuously would see people for who they were. Your beautiful created child and Lord you see us that way and you have welcomed us in and there are so many more people in this world who are far from you that you came to seek and to save the lost and you've called us to do the same so Lord help us to be a light to those people Lord, in a world that is driven by, by hatred, in a world that is uh, so divisive, Lord, I pray that we as the church don't join into that, but instead we live differently and we become a light in that place, Lord. And that those who are far from you, Lord, we will instead of pushing them further away, we will show them a beautiful pathway to a relationship with their creator. Lord, we thank you for your love. There's a reality in the church world. It's the reason why that book that I quoted was even written. And that's because Christians in the church have not always represented the love of Jesus very well. And so if you're here in this room this morning and someone who's claimed to be a follower of Jesus or a church has not treated you with love, They've not welcomed you in. They've not helped you understand who Jesus is and how he sees you. I just want to say as a leader in a church, I'm so sorry that that has happened to you. And I want you to know that no matter what your story is, Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. And that he loves you deeply and that you are made in his image and he wants to draw you close. We give this opportunity every week because it's the most important decision we can make in our life. And that's if you've never stepped into a relationship with Jesus. He's been pursuing you, whether you knew it or not. And he wants to have a relationship with you. Many of us have already said yes to that and we're walking in this beautiful relationship with our creator. But if you're here and you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never made a decision to enter into that relationship, 
Will you just raise your hand and say, I want to make that decision today. I want to give my life to Jesus. Yeah, I see you. Awesome. I see you. I'm amazing. Anybody else want to make that decision? Yeah, bro. With you. Awesome. Yep, I see you. With you. Praise God. Well, more importantly than me seeing you guys who raised your hand, Jesus sees you. And he wants that relationship with you. And when you join into a relationship with Jesus, you, you get to feel his love. He also will take you down a pathway of healing. He'll take you down a pathway of growth. He'll maybe turn you into somebody you didn't even know you could ever be. Because that's how Jesus works in our lives. But he sees your hand. And you know, the last story I would want to tell you about Jesus putting people first is when he put all of us first by going on the cross for us. The Bible says that the cost of our sin, the wage of our sin is death. And so Jesus took that death, our death, upon himself and went on the cross because he was putting us first because of his deep love for us. So remember that when you feel unloved, that Jesus loved you that much. Lord, we love you. We praise you, Lord, for these who raised their hands today. Lord, I pray that you would just enter in, Lord, and fill them with your Holy Spirit and show them what it looks like to be a true follower of you. We praise you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.